Thank you so much, uh, Justice Michael Kirby. And um, we had the fortune at OP General Global University to hear Justice Michael Kirby on our campus this morning where he addressed the 40 plus Australian students. And, and I mentioned in summing up earlier today that in many senses as a, as a student or practitioner of law in Australia, it is, it is certainly a rite of passage um, to, to be addressed and, and to learn and listen to, um, to, to Michael Kirby. And I, I think we've all been uh, delighted and certainly honoured to, to hear from you today, sir, once again. Um, across the Indian Ocean. I, I wanted to mention something that Justice Michael Kirby said 21 years ago once again. He said that Australian lawyers do not know enough about India, and I warrant the same is true the other way around. It is with speeches such as these uh, and initiatives such as the Immersion Plan that really try and bridge that gap. Um, and I would like to once again thank you for being with us here today at the Indian Law Institute. I also wanted to mention uh, that earlier today, Vice Chancellor Raj Kumar uh, appointed Justice Michael Kirby and he uh, did us the honour of accepting that appointment to be an honorary adjunct professor of OP General Global University. <laughs> so while today we were honoured to hear this fantastic lecture, I'm, I'm confident that this will not be the last occasion that uh, Justice Kirby will grace us with his presence and his words of wisdom as well. I also wanted to mention, um, and I've mentioned it previously, but not to our, our guests in the audience, that there are two Indian citizens that have ever been awarded an Order of Australia. Indian citizens. One is the famous cricketer Sachin Tendulkar, but he was the second person to be awarded that, the highest honour in Australia. The second person. The first person to receive that honour is sitting before us today, Mr Soli Sarabji. And I think it's, it's fitting to, to mention this, not only to acknowledge the presence of Soli Sarabji, the former Attorney General of, of India, but also due to the fact that everyone in this room and everyone in this country, indeed, has heard of Sachin Tanduka. And the very fact that the first order of Australia to an Indian citizen was made to a distinguished lawyer speaks words of how close the Australia-India legal relationship is and should be. And again, uh, patrons of this relationship, relationship such as Soliji and Justice Michael Kirby, um, are leading the way for future generations such as our young law students and other students in the audience. So thank you again, uh, Justice Kirby, for those words and Soliji for your presence here today. I'd, I'd now like to briefly introduce our next speaker, Justice Chandrachud, who is a Supreme Court judge. And one need only look uh, in a preliminary glance of his long bio to see that the first university listed in his long list of u universities that he has presented at around the world is the Australian National University in Canberra. So hopefully that was a fantastic experience for you, sir, in Australia, and I'm sure it was for, our, for the students back there too. We indeed have a number of ANU students in the audience with us today. Uh, so once again, we'd, we'd like to thank you for presiding over this lecture, and I'd like to welcome you to, to give the presidential address for today. Thank you, Sean. Justice Michael Kirby, Professor Rajkumar, Mr. Manoj Sinha, very distinguished, Justice Satanta Kumar, Mr. Sodi Sarabji, the Deputy High Commissioner, Mr. Salman Khurshid, and friends. Australia and India have so much in common, but I think the, the most important amongst them, at least in so far as the 1.3 billion Indians are concerned is cricket. I must tell you a story which relates to somebody in the legal profession in Australia who I know very personally. I have two wonderful friends in Australia, Justice Kirby and Hilary Charlesworth, with whom I studied many years ago for, uh, for my post-graduation. Sean just mentioned that I was visiting Australia, and that was in 2003 when I was uh, at the Australian National University. And my good friend Hillary told me a very interesting story of the visit of the Indian cricket team 
to Australia when the Indian High Commissioner invited some of the very distinguished citizens for an evening uh, reception. And Hillary's young son, Will, is crazy about cricket, or was crazy about cricket then. So she asked the Indian High Commissioner as to whether she could get, his, get her family along. And he said, of course you can get your family along. There's no difficulty about that. So she said she introduced, uh, she had the Indian High Commissioner introduce little Will, who was six years old, to Sachin Tendulkar. And he was, as anybody else would be, absolutely awestruck. Well, he got autographs, and then they went home. And then uh, Hilary said, well, I told him it was 10 o'clock, and he hadn't even brushed for the night. So she said, Will, aren't you going to brush your teeth? It's 10 o'clock now. So he said, I don't want to go to the bathroom. So she said, why? You have to go and brush your teeth. So I don't want to hold my hand under water. <laughs> so she says, why? She said, I just shook hands with God. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you don't brush your, you, sh you don't wash your hands and you shake hands with God. <laughs> so that's as close as our connections go. Though we have been on the losing end of the very fast and bouncy wicket at Perth. But wait, wait until the next time that Virat Kohli and company come and visit Australia. Uh, Justice Kirby, thank you very much for that wonderfully powerful speech which you delivered uh, a short while ago. It's always a great honor to be in the presence of Justice Kirby, one of the most distinguished and influential jurists of our times, who has also been described as Australia's voice of reason, intellect, and compassion. Even after his remarkable tenure as the longest serving judge of the High Court of Australia, Michael continues to be associated with the causes of human rights and justice across the world. His appointment as member of the Secretary General's high level panel on access to essential health care, or as chairperson of the UN Human Rights Council's Commission of Inquiry, on human rights violations in DPRK, that is North Korea, demonstrate how he has used law as an instrument of justice. There are various things which Australia and India shared in common in terms of our legal histories. And one of them is our connect with the former British Empire. I'm sure a lot of you would have known of the name of John Lang a famous Australian lawyer whose love for India could be seen by his fight against the colonial British rule by representing the queen of Jhansi, Rani Lakshmibai, against the unjust doctrine of lapse before the governor general. I can think of another great friend of India, and that is someone who is here with us, Justice Kirby, from whom we have just heard. His love for India can not only be seen through his unrivaled mastery over Australian as well as Indian constitutional law, but also from his engagements and deep personal connections that he shares with the people of our country. I'll broadly focus on a few themes because I'm in a presidential lecture and I really, I understand that I have to wrap up this evening's event. Justice Kirby began by speaking about the relationship and the commonalities between Indian and Australian constitutional law. I had a brush with it last year in one of the dissents which I delivered as a member of a nine judge bench dealing with the issue of interstate trade and commerce. Section 92 of the Australian constitution, as Michael just told us a short while ago, says that trade commerce and intercourse among the nations shall be absolutely free. The Indian Constitution used a slightly different phraseology. The Indian Constitution says, there shall be a freedom of trade, commerce, and intercourse throughout the territory of India. So there were two critical departures which were made. One, the expression among the states was replaced by the expression throughout the territory of India. So it is not merely cross-border trade and commerce which is regulated and the freedom of which is guaranteed by the Indian Constitution, but 
any any restraint on trade or commerce within the territory of a of a geographical unit such as the state or a political unit such as the state. The second, as Michael pointed out, was that we gave up the expression absolutely free because absolutely free was liable to cause the interpretation that it is not susceptible to any restriction, even if it is in the public interest. So we adopted the phrase, there shall be freedom of trade, commerce, and intercourse. And we adopted, unlike the Commerce Clause of the American Constitution, we adopted the expression intercourse to emphasize that freedom of movement of human beings across geographical body barriers is as important to the preservation of a unified common market if we have to create one pan-India market, so to speak. Now, in Australia, we, we adopted in India many years ago the notion of compensatory taxes. The issue arose as to whether a tax would affect the freedom of trade, commerce, and intercourse. And the view in India was that a tax which directly impinges upon the freedom of trade, commerce, and intercourse impedes trade and commerce and therefore is unconstitutional. But our court, borrowing from the early Australian decisions, held that if a tax is compensatory, that tax facilitates trade, commerce, and intercourse, and therefore that is not constitu unconstitutional. Now, a whole body of law grew up in India on whether a tax is or is not compensatory. Do your receipts have to match the expenditure which you incur in providing infrastructure for trade, commerce, and intercourse? The problem was that the theory of compensatory taxes was applied in India probably several decades after it was debunked in Australia by the Australian, by, by the High Court. We finally buried it last year in India by saying that there is no notion of compensatory taxes. Like many other judge-made notions, this really has no basis in constitutional law. But the dissent which I delivered was on this, that the majority of our court held that a tax can never impede trade, commerce, and intercourse. Because a tax is an expense or an expenditure which a businessman has to account for in planning the expenditure of the business. I said, no, a tax equally can constitute an impingement of trade, commerce, and intercourse if the effect of the tax is directly to impede trade, commerce, and intercourse. Now, this really suggests to you that we have in India borrowed very large segments of the Australian Constitution, particularly in the context of establishing our own federal structure. We are not a completely federal structure, but in terms of the nation of uh, a quasi-federal nation that we, that we profess to be. I think apart from the fact that we share a common, a common ethos of our connect with the British Empire, the common history between India and Australia also brought the principles of common law and adopted the principles of common law in both our nations. The judgments of the Privy Council in the UK served as a valuable source of jurisprudence that is used by courts even today in India, for instance. Yet while both countries have owed a significant amount of their success to these developments, it can hardly be denied that both our countries have undergone a significant and positive transformation after our relationship with a colonial empire. History is replete, history is replete with instances where the most just laws have resulted in the gravest of injustices when placed in the wrong hands. One glaring example that comes to mind is the case of our criminal law in India, which contains the ingredient of both the actus reus and mens rea as an essential component of crime. This principle forms the bedrock of Indian criminal jurisprudence. And yet, in the Victorian era, we saw the emergence of the defense of the Indian spleen, as it was. Anthropology and medicine joined hands in colonial India so that a principle had been evolved that Indians have enlarged spleens, and therefore, a Briton who dealt a blow to an Indian that resulted in his or her death could not have had the adequate mens rea to cause the death of the person in question. So the enlarged spleen theory led to this, that Britons would be convicted of hurt instead of murder. 
it is noteworthy that with the constitution now, we have gone beyond many of these wrongs, should I say, of our colonial jurisprudence. And our courts have tried hard to replace the, the old law, which was a vehicle of racial discrimination, to a law which protects fundamental rights. So I think our histories, our common histories, and something which Justice Kirby also spoke about, is that the law is as good or as bad as the judges who enforce that law. But there is something more to it. The law is as good or as bad, depending upon those in civil society who take it upon themselves to ensure that violations of law by the executive, by any source whatsoever, by any organized group in society, is not taken, is not taken lightly. We have, both Australia and India, share a common ethos. And this common ethos underlies both our constitutions. Australia didn't have a Bill of Rights, as we have in part three of the Constitution. But even so, even so, as we've now seen with the enactment of the Human Rights Act, the Human Rights Act in, uh, in the UK, for instance, has brought our constitutions closer but even without a Bill of Rights, as, it, as, it originally, uh, as the position originally stood, there were two fundamental underpinnings of our constitutions. First, our commitment to the rule of law, and second, our commitment to democracy. And our commitment in Australia, as well as in India, to the rule of law and to democracy really places central focus on the role of the individual the role of the individual in our societies. And when you speak of the individual as being subject to the central focus of law, particularly constitutional law, you necessarily focus on issues such as the dignity of the individual, the liberty of the individual, and the autonomy of the individual. So both our constitutions in that sense share a quest for justice, because the quest for justice, which is founded in the rule of law, is a quest for justice not merely to be governed by law, but to, govern by, but to be governed by just principles of law and by just laws. It's important for us as judges, I believe, to realize and understand the importance of the linkages between our two nations. My own work as a judge over the last 17, it will be almost 18 years now, our work has an important bearing on the societies in which we dispense justice. Yet there is something about judging which makes judges very provincial, almost introspective, and perhaps aloof from society. And that's one of the great dangers of being a judge. Namely, that the focus of our work makes us increasingly drawn inwards as a result of which there's a grave danger that a judge can lose a certain degree of contact with reality outside. And these linkages between judges, between judges in Australia and India, between judges in the common law world, is important for us to realize that in our work, we as judges are not alone. We share common concerns. We share common apprehensions and fears. We share common visions, and we also share the same failings. Globalization at a certain stage, at a certain level, has meant a global flows of capital and trade. But from a human rights perspective, I would think that what globalization underlies is that, the human, is that it underlies the unity of humankind which knits together judges whose primary work is in dealing with injustice resulting from the denial of rights within their societies. And the fact that we are not alone in our work, that judges across the common law world are sharing the same concern about trying to right wrongs, sometimes very grave wrongs which result in society, helps strengthen the work which we do in, quest, in our quest for greater justice in our societies.
most of our constitutions, written constitutions, whether it's the American constitution, whether it's the Australian constitution or the Indian constitution, these are not all foreseeing blueprints of governance. Constitutions, even elaborate constitutions like the Indian constitution, which, is, which has been amended on a very large number of occasions, constitutions lay down the broad framework for governance of a society. But there are a large number of areas where the constitution is necessarily silent. And there the issue arises before courts as to how would the court really fill in these constitutional silences. When we decided the privacy case, that was one of the issues. That is, the constitution was silent on whether there is, in that sense, a right to privacy. But what are those principles which the courts or the judges must apply in filling constitutional silences? There may be constitutional silences which open doors, such as when you read rights in a more expansive way, when you, need, when you read new rights into broad frameworks of the Bill of Rights, such as in the Indian Constitution. There may be door-closing silences, where you read constitutional silences as a restraint on the exercise of governmental power. So these are door-closing silences in the sense that they tell authority that these areas are closed to you. But in trying to interpret constitutional silences or constitutional implications, one of the key problems which judges face across the world is, what are the basic principles that you apply in giving meaning to constitutional silences? Because if you don't have a common set of principles, if you don't have a common foundation, judges are then exposed to the charge that your reading meaning into constitutional silences is nothing but an exercise of judicial discretion. And then judicial discretion can sometimes be construed as a judiciary entrenching upon areas which lie beyond what is reserved for the judiciary. So in giving meaning to these constitutional silences, it's important that we draw principles from the Constitution itself. Constitutional principles such as the rule of law. For instance, in, the, in a matter which we decided recently on whether there are any restraints on the power of the union government, the president or the governors in the states, to make ordinances, we drew upon the rule of law principles which emerged from the Constitution itself. What happens when an ordinance, which has a very short shelf life, does something which will operate in eternity? Is that valid for the future? Or can the court strike it down? So these are essentially aspects which you draw from constitutional principles. Is there something called constitutional morality? And if there is a sense of constitutional morality, is that sense of constitutional morality different from the morality of people outside? Is that morality counter-majoritarian? Is that morality of the Constitution majoritarian? Or is the, are there certain constitutional values which perhaps lie even beyond the majoritarian opinion of, or the popular opinion of the day? Are there some values which are embodied in the Constitution which perhaps lie beyond the shifting opinions of the day. So these are some of the very crucial issues which concern the courts. Another area which I want to briefly dwell on is the extent to which Justice Kirby has really in that sense brooked the trend and has, in his judgments, emphasized the importance of interpreting domestic law and giving interpretation and meaning to domestic law in the context of Australia's international obligations. One of the key cases which comes to mind is the judgment in Newcrest Mining, Western Australia Limited versus the Commonwealth of Australia, where the legislature had passed an amendment to the National Parks and Wildlife Conservation Act of 1975, whereby the Commonwealth was not required to pay compensation to those affected by the amendment. Justice Kirby, on this occasion, for the majority held that the purpose of the act was to give effect to Australia's international obligations. The judgment also followed the Bangalore principles by stating that where the constitution is ambiguous, the court should adopt a meaning 
that conforms to the principles of fundamental rights than a departure from those rights. It is noteworthy that the judgment of Justice Kirby did so without incorporating treaties into domestic law to the back door. In another very important case with wide-ranging ramifications, there was this case of Jack Thomas, a Melbourne taxi driver, who was found guilty of accepting funds from a terrorist network. The Victorian Court of Appeal quashed his conviction, but the police then imposed a control order on him under the Australian Constitution's defense powers. Thomas argued that the control orders were unconstitutional, and though the majority court held it was legitimate for the Australian government to legislate for control orders under the defense powers of the Constitution, Justice Kirby issued a strong dissent, and I'll come to the importance of dissents very shortly, which was widely praised for upholding the constitutional principles of equal justice for all and the value of human rights, even those of a suspected terrorist. Justice Kirby held, and I quote, unless this court adheres to established rules governing the validity of federal laws and the deployment of federal courts applying such laws, it abdicates the vital role assigned to it by the Constitution and expected of it by the people that would truly deliver to terrorists successes that their own acts could never secure in Australia. We in India have also had to deal with the interface between constitutional law and international law. Our judgment and privacy itself adopted the principles which emerged from a whole range of jurisdictions, or the judgment in Vishaka, which dealt with sexual harassment in the workplace, dwelt upon CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. We've dealt with a variety of conventions, international conventions in our recent judgments. Finally, let me conclude where I began, namely the value of dissent. Dissenting opinions to my mind, and Justice Kirby has been the leader, the thought leader there, have served as a powerful tool to aid the evolution of law. It is often seen in a country such as India that yesterday's dissent is today's majoritarian opinion. Yet I believe that there is a certain restraint in India to the expression of dissent. Perhaps it may have something to do with our cultural traditions where we try and accommodate. We accommodate within the family. We don't openly criticize. But I think it's important that this tradition must change over a period of time. We must change in keeping with an increasingly impatient young India, which is ready to ask questions, to scrutinize. And as Professor Rajkumar would, I'm sure, agree, is not willing to accept established principles of yesteryear. We have had a strong tradition of dissent in isolated instances of judges' lives. Justice Fazil Ali, Justice Subarao, Justice Khanna, three of the greatest dissents in India which have changed the face of Indian polity. Justice, the dissent in Gopalan, for instance, was subsequently accepted in Manika Gandhi, a judgment which Justice Kirby spoke about. Or Justice Subarao's dissent in New Manika Spinning versus Textile Labor, which, found, which paved the foundation of the Payment of Bonus Act in India, which was an important legislation. Above all, I think dissenting opinions remind us that the Constitution is indeed a living document and must be construed keeping in mind the evolution of society. Justice Kirby himself has been a proponent of the living force theory of the Constitution in his time when he served at the High Court of Australia. In a judgment of 1999 in Inre Vakim, and subsequently in a speech which Justice Kirby made, he cited with approval the dictum of Justice Windeyer in the payroll tax case, and I, I'd, I'd love to conclude with that. And he said, when an old line of authority is overturned, this may sometimes be explained, not by reference to an error in the perception of the justices who propounded that authority at the time of its in invention and first application, but rather by the fact that the eyes of new generations of Australians inevitably see the unchanged language in a different light. The words remain the same, 
The meaning and content of the words take color from the circumstances in which the words must be understood and to which they must be applied. So I think the great power which judges have in that sense, which dwells within, is a power which is also coupled with a very sobering reflection. It's a great power. It's a power to shape the words of the Constitution by breathing into those words your vision for what should constitute a just society. But it's also a power which is coupled with a sobering reflection how, for, how easily, of how easily your vision could be changed as today's society gives way to new societies with new aspirations. So I, I think I should uh, conclude with that and uh, thank uh, Professor Rajkumar and the Indian Law Institute for inviting me and to Justice Kirby, one of the greatest friends of India, for being here and with the hope and expectation that your adjunct professorship will bring you here many, many more times and very often, oftener than you have in the past. Thank you. So I'd, I'd like now, now like to call Professor Manoj Kumar Sinha to the microphone. Thank you very much, Ron. And uh, we were so excited to hear Justice Kirby and Justice Chanchur. So somehow we missed to present the bouquet. So bouquet is here so from the Indian launch. <laughs> <laughs> I request Rajkumar to present the bouquet to Honorable Justice Chanchur. I don't want to reveal our age, but still I can give you some guess. Rajkumar and me are known for 24 years, and Murthy as well. So from 94, I think 93 onwards, we met, We all met in the common place in the National Human Rights Commission. Though later on we moved in life, and still there is a long distance between the Indian Law Institute and the OOP Jindal in Sonipat. But still, a mere call from Rajkumar activates everything, or even if I call Rajkumar, it takes hardly one second to take a decision, and uh, we are keep on organizing the activities. I am thankful, Rajkumar, that you take a lot of interest, and similarly, I try to, whatever way I can assist in the promoting legal education in India, or promoting seminar, conferences, and other things. So uh, I have brought a big note, but I'm not going to discuss that point, because already we are late. Uh, I just want to add one particular point that particularly with the Honorable Justice uh, Kirby has mentioned about the race, issue of the race. India uh, is the one country who played very important role in the adoption of the UN Convention of Racial Elimination of Racial Discrimination in 1961 and because, and then the issue was there. So India played very important role in particularly in the race issue. Somehow there's a mix up between race and caste and that leads to a lot of confusion. So I don't know, maybe later on we'll discuss about this particular issue. But I appreciate that like Bangkok principles which you mentioned. Unfortunately, even as a uh, teacher of, a law teacher, we hardly take note of these important documents in India. And we go more on the UDHR, ICCPR, and other documents while teaching in the human rights, and of course the decisions of the Supreme Court and High Court related to the human rights. But uh, Bangkok principle is, has become more or less as the Bangkok principle. There's a Bangkok principle which is very important for the protection of refugee in India, and India is party of that Bangkok principle. But when we talk about the refugee law, we talk about the International Convention, but we never spoke about the Bangkok principle, which India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all countries are party. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We just recently renovated this room, and we were looking for an occasion to inaugurate, so like the new seat is placed. And I'm very happy this, uh, this has started with a very good note. The 2018. This is the first seminar we both are organizing, and I'm sure the gathering which are here today, the large number of the people which Son has brought, Son star is really a star. He brought a lot of Australian <laughs> people. Yeah, I'm very, this is the so a national conference has give, become an international conference for two hours. I'm very thankful to the Son taking initiative, and because of you, this particular exercise and uh, has a great success. I thank. 
Honorable Justice Kirby, Honorable Justice Chanchur, Honorable Justice Satyant Kumar Ji, Swali Swarab Ji, Sanman Sid Sir, P.H. Parikh, Indra Jai Singh is also here, Anand Grover Sir is also here. So thank you for coming. This is the first time I see so much eminent person sitting in the Indian Law Institute. Thank you very much. And we have arranged tea and snacks in the outside, so kindly join us there. Thank you very much.